Praise God. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Hope you had a wonderful Christmas. Yesterday, we had uh, our candlelight service here the other night. Many of you were here, and uh, we had a really good crowd here. It was, it was a fun night, so we're glad you're here today. We know with the holiday yesterday, uh, we know there's going to be far fewer here today, perhaps because of the holiday, but we're glad you're here. Amen? Amen. So let's ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we want to give you the praise, and we want to give you the glory. And God, I am thankful for the Christmas season. I'm just thankful that people are, to some degree, mindful of, of some things of God. Not, not all of them, but some things. I thank you, Father, for every nativity scene. I thank you for every angel, because they speak of, of the announcement of your coming, and they speak to the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. So, Lord, have your way in this service this morning. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. Lord, we know you're here. May we be here. Sometimes we can be somewhere and not really be there. Lord, may we be here. May we encompass this space with your presence. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Praise God. Let's worship the Lord. Those who can stand, would you please stand for worship?
been lifted, grace is waiting. Dance like the weight has been lifted, grace is waiting. going to have prayer a little bit later so uh, wait till I come back up and we'll be leading in prayer uh, we're going to have definitely a special time of prayer for some very specific needs that are happening in, in our body so uh, that'll be a little bit later okay okay
praise you, Lord. You know, Lord, that for some people that sounds like that is a, a kind of a blasphemous thing. But you said that we were going to be like little children. And that's what little children do. They run, they shout, they, they get excited, and they run right to you. Lord, that's what we have to do. We have to stop looking at all the other things that are going on and start looking toward you and being excited about you and what you're doing. Because the enemy's done enough. I'm tired of hearing about what he's done. I want to hear about what God's done. So, Lord, pour out your spirit. Let your Holy Spirit move upon us. Because you know our hearts need your move. We can't stay in the same place and be growing in Christ. We have to keep moving. So, Lord, move us today in Jesus' name.
river Let worship turn into revival Lord, lead us back to you Praise you, Lord Revive us, Lord. Revive us. Lord, we need a change. We need things in hearts and lives and, and people, and neighborhoods and cities, Lord. They need to change. Lord, how much do you have to do in order to get our attention? How much do you have to do? Lord, right now, we just want to pray for our families. We want to lift them up to you, those that are saved and those that are not, Lord. Those that have walked away, those that are not living the life that they should, Lord. We just lift them up to you right now in Jesus' name. We ask for revelation knowledge for them that they will know that they know that you are God and that they need to change their lives and they need to draw close to you. We just give you praise and glory and honor because I know in my heart that your will is for every person to be saved. That's your plan, but not every person will choose it. So, Lord, we just ask that you would touch, touch their hearts and tug at their heartstrings. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Before we finish with a song, we're going to go to prayer right now. And I'm going to ask uh, um, that those of you that have a need, I want you to, wherever you're at, if you could make it to the aisle and stand there. And uh, we're not going to get, ar get around and be as physical as usual because of uh, COVID right now. Um, so if you want prayer, just stand out in the aisle. And uh, I have, uh, many of you know, but many of you don't know, but uh, uh, Dennis Holland and his wife Trudy, they're usually here every time the door opens. Um, they were here um, two nights ago, and uh, yesterday morning at 8.15, she fell down and had a very, very massive stroke. And um, uh, so my heart is uh, very heavy. <laughs> I love that lady, and uh, they've been married 60, how many years, 60, six, just six, 61, okay, they've been married 61 years, she is uh, 85, I think, years old, something like that, virtually in perfect health up to that moment, and uh, we never know what a moment will bring in our lives, do we, and, uh, but uh, uh, Dennis is uh, at TriPoint, and um, uh, we definitely want to go to prayer for them. And uh, uh, according to what the doctors are saying, that she will be with the Lord soon. That's, that's the way it's sounding. This is not something that they think she's going to get better. Only God knows. But Dennis is uh, he's prepared. And uh, I was with him two times yesterday. And he's, he's in the Lord and clinging to God's word and his promises. And Folks, this is why we get saved. Amen. We don't get saved just to live an abundant life. We get saved so that we have eternal life. Mm -hmm. And I want us to also keep Daryl Anderson in prayer. His rehab has been going very well, but this, uh, they, he has a sore now on his heel, and that's not good. He can't do his rehab now. they got to deal with that. Um, uh, uh, Loretta... Hermadka has COVID, but she's she's doing well with this new one. It's it's not like <laughs> like it was a year ago, thank God. And um, the Thomases are sick, and and other people are dealing with uh, health issues. So let's just go to the Lord right now. Those that want to touch in body, just step out into the aisle, or you have something on your heart that you just want to bring to the Lord. Just step out there, and we'll see you. I want the members to look around. Let's point in the direction of somebody. Praise God, and let's let's first lift up our brother Dennis. And Father, we ask for Dennis and his family this morning. God, we we all know deep down in our hearts, we know that we're going to get to heaven one some way. I was I've always hoped that the Lord you would just come and take us all at once. <laughs> That's the way I've always wanted it to be, but I've had to learn that. Whether I like it or not, one by one, people we love go ahead. And Lord, we pray right now for Dennis. Your Holy Spirit is with him in great measure. I told him the whole church will be praying this morning. Be with him. Many of us have crossed this line of the sand with others that we've loved, that we love. And we pray for Dennis. We pray for Trudy. Lord, have your way with, with her. She's yours. She belongs to you. And as the Apostle Paul said, whether I am alive or whether I'm dead, I'm in the Lord. Hallelujah. Whether I'm here on earth or I'm in heaven, either way, 
She belongs to you. So God, we pray that grace and mercy for that family today in Jesus' precious name. We pray for Loretta and other members of our congregation, Daryl Anderson, Lord, that you touch them. Those that are standing in the aisles, many that are in the aisle this morning, God, you know each the need in each and every one of their lives, Lord. Some things may be spoken, some don't need to be. God, because you see the heart. So, Lord, we ask in Jesus' precious name for these in the, in the aisles, Lord, you know the, the things that are on their heart. You know the situations, Lord, that they're dealing with. You know the things going on in their body, in their mind, in their hearts. So, Lord, we just plead the blood of the Son of God over our brothers and sisters. We thank you for the forgiveness that's found in that blood, but I thank you for the healing that was provided by your stripes as well. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. Even in the midst of our sorrow, we praise a, a living God, hallelujah, who has the power over death itself. You proved it by coming into the world as an infant. You proved it by living sinless. You proved it by dying on the cross for our sins. But you really proved it when you rose again from the dead and you sit at the right hand of the Father this morning. And you intercede for every member of this congregation, as well as every believer on the face of this planet, every sinner that will call out to you today. You hear us all. And God, we want to thank you and praise you for just being our God. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Praise God. One more song. Praise God. Amen. Try to stop your love when you want wage war. Try to take the very thing you gave your life for. You would come running, tear up every wall, all the while shouting, my love, you're worth it all. God, you pursue me, power and glory, unstoppable love that
Our Lord is worthy, isn't he? Amen. Amen. Praise God. And even in the midst of sorrow as we're going through some of the things that we're going through. And uh, this morning I want to touch on uh, really how the struggle that we, we, we go through in life. There's a, How many know there's a lot of struggle in life? <laughs> how, many, how many believe that once you, you think you get to the place where you're not going to struggle as much anymore. How many get real surprised? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, team. Hallelujah. What a, what a glory to God. Thank you. Praise God. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, praise God. We had a wonderful um, Christmas Eve here, and uh, I want to thank all of you that showed up. We had a blast. It was just a uh, an amazing night here together, and uh, the wise guys sang. How was it? Pretty good? Is it okay? Yeah. The, people think we, we're called the wise guys to be funny. No, we're serious. We have wisdom in Christ. Hallelujah. Amen? I mean, we're trying to be serious with it, and people, people don't believe us at first. Hallelujah. But we have the wisdom in Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. It's working. Thank you, Al. Hallelujah. Praise God. Up oh, the format's off a little bit. And yeah, we'll see if we can straighten that out. I'll, I'll just continue while you're trying to frame it up. Bible study on Wednesday morning that we usually have is canceled until uh, January 19th at uh, uh, 11, uh, 11 o'clock to 12:30 and uh, so they're going to take a we're going to take a few weeks off give faith the rest hallelujah she is an amazing uh, bible teacher those of you that come to the study you know that that is one of the best isn't it one of the best bible studies you've ever been in your life i'm serious god has gifted us with just some amazing people here praise god and uh, we praise God for that coming. The Godspeed Cafe Men's Fellowship. The next time will be January 5th. So this Wednesday is the fifth Sunday of December. There will be no men's fellowship. Uh, but the next time we come together, we're going to have some of Lisa's famous pulled pork. Uh, dinner with sides, desserts, and drinks. And two weeks from then, in the middle of January, we're going to have some of Judy Freeman's World famous lasagna. So the guys, we're 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 going to be eating good in the hood. Amen. Hallelujah. This New Year's Eve, which will be Friday night at seven o'clock, we're going to have a movie. I still believe. Um, do not bring any snacks. We we have plenty of snacks here, uh, so we'll be providing uh, the snacks and drinks. Just come and let's have a great time, and 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 we'll close out uh, in prayer. And we're going to pray in the new year. Hallelujah. Uh, whenever the movie's over, we're going to go to prayer and uh, trust the Lord. The message today, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. Amen? Now, when I was preparing this message this week, I had no idea what was going to happen yesterday. So this certainly looks different to me today than it did Two days ago. Amen. Hallelujah. Anybody know who this is? Yogi Berra. What's he famous for? It ain't over till it's over. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It's not a Bible verse, but, but it almost is. <laughs> Amen. Because there's a whole lot of Bible that kind of talks like this. Amen. We're going to look at some Bible characters first. And I'm going to um, I'm going to ask you some, uh, maybe a question or two, and I'm going to need some help with some answers, okay? But let's look at Joseph. Now, we know the story of Joseph. He was the favorite uh, of his father, and 
His brothers hated him because of the favor that he had with dad, and they had a plot to actually kill him. And uh, one of the brothers was talked out of murdering the brother and said, listen, let's just uh, throw him in this, this cistern. And then some Ishmaelite traders came along and they said, hey, we can make money off of selling our brother. He doesn't have to die in this hole. So they pull him out. They sell him. A guy named Potiphar, rich man named Potiphar, buys him, puts him in charge of all of his affairs. Potiphar has a, 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 a really... Um, um, not sure how to word his wife, but she's, she's not a nice girl, okay? She tries to fool around with Joseph, and Joseph, because of his love for the Lord, will not touch her. She gets mad, tells her husband that he tried to rape me, and he's arrested, and, and uh, uh, then he's thrown in jail, of course, and of course we know that he takes over the whole jail, uh, then we go to Job, and Job, you could write a book on it, but we already have a whole book in the Bible, <laughs> amen? And Job's story is very long. The bottom line is he is righteous, and he, he loves God, he's wealthy, he's rich, everything is wonderful, but a testing comes in his life where he loses most of his family, he loses his crops. Sores cover his body. His wife basically says, uh, curse God and die. Then we come to Moses. And Moses is an interesting character. We, we know, obviously, that, that he was saved from death, God providing uh, a mini ark for him, hallelujah, as he is found in the bulrushes in a little basket by Pharaoh's daughter. She brings him into the king's court. He literally grows up as if he was a Pharaoh's son. So he grows up in this opulence and, and, and prestige, and he is, he is, he's extremely intelligent. He's, he's learning uh, in ways. He, he, has, he, he is literally one of the luckiest kids on the planet. And uh, one day he sees an Egyptian slave master beaten up on, on uh, the, uh, the Hebrews, and he gets ticked, and and basically, I don't think he, he meant to kill him, but he did. He killed him. And then he ran uh, for the next 40 years. He becomes then a nomadic. And of all people, to go from where he was to be hanging out with uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, and working uh, the back 40. And then we have Peter. And we know the story of Peter. Peter tells Jesus, if everybody else denies you, I won't. <laughs> Famous last words, you know what I mean? And we know what happened um, within hours, really within a few days maybe of when he spoke that. He's warming his hands at the fire, and we know what happens. He denies Christ three times, and he goes out and weeps bitterly. Now I'm going to ask you the question. What do all four men have in common? What do they have in common? What? Love to God? Yeah, they love God, but what do they really have in common? Besides the love for God? Huh? Eventually, but... Yeah, yeah, I didn't show that, did I? What did I do? I just showed you the problems they had. No, they finished, all four of them, they finished strong. They finished strong. All four of those guys finished strong. It didn't matter how bad the things that came against them. They were good for it. Hallelujah. They were good for it. And the rest of their lives is, is occupied in countless chapters of the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. So they finished strong. And Ecclesiastes 7, 8 says, the end of the matter is better than its beginning. The end of the matter is better than its beginning. If Trudy goes to be with the Lord today, and there's a very good chance she will. If it's not today, it'll be tomorrow or the next day. But she finished strong. 
She finished loving God. She finished loving her husband, loving her family, loving the church, loving worship. Everything she touched had that touch to it. There was that fingerprint of obedience and faithfulness and humility. My wife uh, told me, um, we had them over on um, Thanksgiving. And after she left, my wife said, she said, honey, that's, that lady is one of the most beautiful people I've ever known in my life. My wife just loved Trudy. And she loved talking to her and just listening to her. And there was, there's a grace, there's a measure of, 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 of God's depth and, and his, his mercy in her life that was inescapable if you, if you were to know her you, you would see it. It, it, was, it was blatant. I'm not saying that because she's on her deathbed. I'm saying that because she lived from the moment she came to Christ. She's finishing strong. And the end is going to be better than the beginning. That is the hope of eternal life that God gives all those who truly trust Christ. Hallelujah. The end of the matter is better. The end of the matter is better. In Ecclesiastes 3.1, this verse just comes to my mind so often. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. There is a time for everything. We can attempt to avoid a lot of issues of life. And do you notice how things catch up with you no matter what you kind of do? Do you know what I mean? You, can, you, can think, you think I'm going to avoid certain things in life and I'm shocked uh, because I'm finding that I'm not avoiding very many of those things that I've tried to avoid. I remember many years ago when I was a, a much younger pastor, I'd be at some pastor's conference, and I remember they were uh, talking about, they spent like this whole module talking about pastors getting older and retiring, and people, when they get old, they retire. And I'm sitting there totally bored out of my mind. Because in my mind, it was like I could not even imagine a time in my life that I would even have to worry about that. I was way younger then. And remember when you were younger how somebody wasn't even that old, but you thought they were really old? I, that, man, I remember, I remember when I was like first in the ministry. Somebody could be 55, and I was like, where's your, where's your rocking chair? Okay? And, and it's, it just amazed me how... Just often, it, it seemed like it was so far off in the distance. Well, I'm 67 now, and it, it shocks me that that I that 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 I'm here. <laughs> it shocks me. not that I'm I'm not in heaven yet. It just shocks me that so much of the stuff that I thought was boring. I wish I listened a little more intently when I was younger to some of those teachings because I needed to hear and have a better preparation. Of where I've been. Mike Freeman uh, is going to be retiring in uh, a few days. And, uh, I, but I remember Mike Freeman when he was on the other side of that ball. I remember when Mike came to the Lord when he was 20-something. Hallelujah. He gave his heart to the Lord right here in this church. And, and there are many of you, you've, you're, you've gone through a season. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity. And there's lines in the sand you know, when I preach that, that, that we don't know what line in the sand we're going to come to next, but God is on both sides of the line. And when I went to, to stand next to Trudy with Dennis there, I just I couldn't stop thinking about God is on the other side of wherever this is going. There is no place that the true believer can go that the Lord is not there. And that's not only a hope, that is, that, is a, that is a reality, hallelujah. In Luke 14, 28 through 30, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build but wasn't able to finish. My prayer is that every single one of us, our lives will not be judged upon a, a something that God was building and we didn't give him enough time to finish it. Isn't that true? 
And I'm not talking even about getting old. I'm talking about remaining faithful to the task until we get there. Hallelujah. That we remain faithful to whatever the Lord has given us in our lives. Whatever that is. I don't care how small it is. I don't care if it's got a name to it. I don't care if people recognize it. I don't care if people give you glory for it. it do, that doesn't matter. It's are we going to finish strong? Will I love God with all my heart when I close my eyes for the last time on this planet? And, and in other words, will I, I was thinking about this, I want to die with the tank on empty. Amen? Hallelujah. In other words, whatever gas was in the tank, I want to use all of it for the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Amen? And wherever you're at in your life today, you can determine you know, some, some believers, they have a bunch of gas in their tank, but they haven't gone anywhere. Now is the time to engage the, you got a five-speed, whether you know it, engage the clutch, do a little burnout, grab and go. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. And don't let up. Don't let up for the rest of your lives. Praise God. Starting strong is easy. People always get excited about when things start, and that's appropriate. Amen? I remember when one of my, um, when Chris was born, um, I remember in the first week, I think, 10 days that, that he was home, I think we had 68 people or something that came to our house to see the, some ridiculous number. Every relative from here to Timbuktu to the west side of Parma showed up at our house. And I mean, it was unbelievable. So we, we start, it, it's appropriate to start with a bunch of brouhaha, but I want you to know that, that starting strong is easy, but finishing strong, that's admirable. Amen? And all of us can make the choice that we're going to finish strong. Even this year, we can make the choice today, I am finishing this year, stronger than where I perhaps was. Praise God. In Philippians 3.13, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I will do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. And that verse preaches at any time, in any place in our walk. There has never been a time that we could not look at that verse and glean something from it. Paul said, forgetting what is behind, it doesn't mean that he does not uh, have a testimony of what the Lord has done up to a certain spot. So when Paul says forgetting, I don't think he means forgetting in the, in the context of a literal forgetting. Because the Bible warns us, you can't have wisdom if you forget everything. Amen? Hallelujah. So I think what he's talking about is whatever affection that we have for some place in the past. And I'm not talking about uh, what I would call necessary nostalgia. Because necessary nostalgia, that's an important thing. This Christmas season, you are around people and we have traditions that we observe. Folks, that, that's 100% appropriate. Amen. God help us if we get rid of that. Don't forget that. Amen. But I think when he talks about forgetting, I think it's like whenever God moves us from one place to another, okay, it is very easy to, to stay in a place to where we are completely comfortable. And, and sometimes it is not moving physically to a different spot. It is changing the mentality of the mind. It is changing the... Um, uh, the, the way we're looking at something. I, I've had to learn as a pastor that there's so much flex and flow that in the body of Christ and in the history of this church, I've been here long enough so that I've seen good times, I've seen bad times, I've seen terrible times, I've seen euphoric times. I've, I, I feel like I've seen it all, and yet I know that I have no idea what, what tomorrow, six months, a year will bring. But, but, I've, but I've seen God do enough faithfully in, in years past to know that I can trust him for the years in the future. I've seen God be very faithful this last year. For many of us, it might not have been a good year, but we serve a good God. Hallelujah. 
no matter how stupid the year was, okay, God was good. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, we, we, we closed three times in this last year because of COVID, okay? The, the, I know um, one of our sister churches is closed today because a bunch of the members got COVID in the last week. I know of other churches that are suspending services right now. So uh, I'm glad you're here. Hallelujah. Push comes to shove if we have to close again for a few weeks or whatever. I guess we'll do it right now. I don't think we have to, but we've had to learn to ebb and flow. If you'd have told me five years ago that we would come to a place where in one year we would have to close the doors for three different times, I'd have laughed in your face. There is no way that could ever happen. And then I now I realize, like, wow, the Lord is flexible with us. Amen? Hallelujah. And what I rejoice in is how we've come back from things hallelujah we've we've come through very uncertain times but god has been certain hallelujah amen praise god i've had some bad years but our god is a good god how many have had bad years amen how many have had good years how many have had great years yeah how many have had really really bad years how many have had years you wish you don't even remember how bad it was? Okay, amen. Yeah, that's life. And, and, and the, the truth is, God remains God. And, and as, as you grow in your faith, you start to realize that how good something is really isn't the sum total of it all. I used to think, like, whatever, every, whatever we do for the Lord, it, it, it needs to be so successful. And now I realize, no. We just need to remain faithful. Hallelujah. It doesn't, it, don't worry about comparing yourself to other people. Co worry about applying excellence to whatever you will do for the sake of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Dennis and Trudy, that, you know, this, this door barely opens without them being here. Can you remember the last time we had a worship service that they missed? It's hard to remember a week that they weren't sitting in that spot. You know, we, we need people to help in the children's department. We, have, we, we don't have a lot of access to people that want to help. Trudy has practically begged Lisa to let her help, and Lisa's kind of resisted only because um, she's 85 years old, and it's not that she can't do the job. That's not the issue. We just, we, we, we're trying to get younger leadership. And, but we have a lady, 85 years old, that multiple times told Lisa, if you need me, I'm there. Hallelujah. My friends, that's somebody that has a good God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. She was never too old to serve the Lord. She was never too old to say, hallelujah. You know, there, change happens. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the change that's been happening. Obviously, how many of you want, how many of you want to live by faith? Okay, how many want to live by faith? You want to live by faith. I, I want to. I want to be. I want to live by faith. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to prove to you that. Well, let me show you. We got the COVID. Okay. I don't know about you, but the last two years, this is this has really been something that. In all of our we, in our lives, we've never we've never faced something like this. We've never faced what it's doing to culture. We've never faced what it's doing to us physically. We never faced what it's doing to us corporately. Uh, whether you believe uh, whatever you believe about the shot, about the, what the government's doing with it, it's almost immaterial. No matter which way you're looking at this, there's nothing like. This COVID thing is like nothing I've ever experienced in my 67 years of life. I've been around for a while, and this is, this is all kind of new territory to me. Hallelujah. And now our economy is going in the skids, and, and there's many people that deal with chronic pain. We have members in our church that deal with chronic pain. We have people that are dealing with things that, that I could not deal with. My son uh, used to get chronic uh, migraines, and I seldom have a migraine, but once in a while I have a headache, and I know when I have a headache, 90% of what I'm going to do that day is not going to be done. I'm telling you right now. And yet my son with chronic headaches 
will go to school and teach a room full of kids while he has a chronic migraine. I've had to go and pick him up at school in the middle of the day because he, he can't do one more thing. Now, he's doing better in the last six, eight months, praise God. But he, he's dealt with that. Judy, my mother-in-law, had chronic headaches. My wife at time has dealt with stuff. But there's some of you here, you, you deal with chronic pain. And, and that's a real issue. That's not a made-up issue. That's, that's something really that you're going through. And you have to trust God in the midst of dealing with that chronic pain. Some of you deal with emotional things and, and you struggle. Amen? There's just times that's the way it is. I'm not saying it's like that forever. I'm not saying it's like it all the time. But, but we all have things in our life that we deal with. Gas prices are going up. That's, that's, I believe it, that's not going to change. We're dealing with stress. The, the COVID thing alone has added a level of stress. I read recently that uh, 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 psychologists are saying that 20-something percent of elementary school children are dealing with stress levels and mental problems. It's as if they were 15, 16, and they're only seven or eight. So what they're doing to the schools, schools are open, they're shut, they're sitting there on a computer screen. They're never socializing around other children. And uh, really, their, their development is being stunted. But emotionally, uh, we're, we're, in, we're in trouble right now. We have the smash and grab robberies going on. Crime is up. Uh, murders are up 30% across the board. America's got some issues going on, my friends. Um, in colleges and places, you've got uh, Christians that are not even allowed to step foot on Christian colleges. Speakers to come and to confess the gospel are, are resisted, but, but uh, the communist club and and the transgender, the gay clubs, all those people, they've got booths, they've got rooms, they've got classrooms, they've got forums, and Christians in many state uh, where the it tax uh, collecting colleges, many Christians have absolutely almost zero voice now in our culture. We got, we got issues in our nation, my friends. And this one, I believe, is a big one. Because all of us cope with grief. I don't know about you. Anybody here cope with grief? Yeah. We cope with grief. Depending what happens in our life, depending how close something is to our hearts, it may be different from one person to another. But there is very few people here that don't deal with grief. And, and grief is a strange thing. Because you can feel like you got something handled. <laughs> I remember when... Uh, I, my dad died many years ago, and I thought I got through the grief, and that was like, what did he die, 22, 20 years ago, 18 years ago? I'm terrible with the years, but he died a long time ago. And one day, I started thinking about my, just starting thinking about my dad, and out of nowhere, I cried for two straight hours. I've never cried like that in my life. I have no idea why or where that came from. I, I think I'm, a, my wife might <laughs> argue the point, but I think I'm semi-well-adjusted, okay? But, but uh, uh, you know, the, the jury might be out on that completely, amen? But, but, but it, it just blew me away. I mean, it, it was astounding to me. Why did that happen? And, and I've realized lately, I've, I'm thinking of other people that have gone ahead of me and all of a sudden, I'm feeling different than I've ever felt in my life. I, I, I don't even understand some of the changes that I think might be happening. But I believe they're healthy. Because it, the Bible says, weeping endures but for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And we need to understand that grief is part of the process. And all I'm going to tell you is, let it, let it work through. Let it work through. Whatever you got to do, do it. And whatever schedule somebody else has, don't worry about their schedule because your schedule will not be just like theirs. That's another thing. I know some people within months after somebody dies, they're fine. I know other people five years later, it's kind of as if it happened two days ago. And everybody's different. I remember when I went on um, 
a missions trip. And uh, I remember coming home, and, and, and you guys know this story I've told you many times, but, man, I missed Lisa, you know? And uh, I was down there about three, four days doing pretty good, and by the fifth day, I was worthless. And i got to be honest, the ministry I did down there was, the Lord was like, you've heard me say that, the Lord was like saying, what are you doing down here? <laughs> You need, you need to be back to the matter. You're a pastor. You're not going to be a missionary, okay? But I remember just missing Lisa. I mean, I was ready to find a Jamaican with a little boat, give him 50, I had a $50 bill. I'm going to give this guy 50 bucks. We're going to Miami. I'm going home. I mean, I just, I got in this thing to where I was missing Lisa in a way that I never knew I could miss someone. And I'll never forget it. I was sitting with my mom in Burger King in Painesville. And as I began to describe to my mom how it felt, she began to cry. And it hit me. I said, Mom, is that the way you feel? And she said, yeah, sometimes every day. And it shocked me. And I believe that the Lord let me experience that for Lisa so that I would have some sense of understanding of what it's like when someone loses someone that they've been around a long time. Do you know what I'm saying? When you, I remember when I was younger, nobody, remember when you were looking, nobody died. It was like grandma and grandpa was there, all the aunts, cousins, brothers, sisters, everybody's there. But well, we just celebrated a house full of people the other night for Christmas Eve, and I was the oldest person in the room. And it was a strange thing. Mel was there too, but he's not, he's younger than I am, so he doesn't count. Hallelujah. Amen? But it, it's a weird thing because all my, my parents, my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, my brother, I've got cousins. I've, I got all these people. They've already gone into eternity. But I'm still here. So we need to understand grief is a real thing. And it, it's something that we're going to go through. So all I'm, at, all I'm saying is, Allow yourself to work through that process. Allow yourself to work. And the holidays accelerate that. We know that. Because there's, there's things that, that we want to feel. Christmas is never the same for me than it used to be. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, I miss every time a relative went, when that Christmas came, it, it felt different. But God is still with us where we are at. And, we, and do you understand what I'm saying? So we have to, we have to find then, as the, as the tradition may be in the same place in the same time to some degree, but the dimension of, of what is happening is completely different. It's totally different now than it was just 10, 15 years ago. And it's going to be different five years from now than it is now. But you have the Lord to help you navigate, amen, this course. Hallelujah. Praise God. We find ourselves in a unique position that maybe we are living by faith after all. You know how we think, well, I want to live by faith. I want these amazing things to take place. I want to be honest with you. Maybe putting up with what's happening in the world, what's putting up with happening with suffering around us, what's putting up with loss, with putting up with whatever we're putting up with. Maybe we're living by faith after all. You know, one thing I like about the um, Chosen series, my wife and I have been watching uh, the first two seasons of The Chosen. What I like, how many have seen that? If you have not, never seen The Chosen, it is off the, ch on a scale of 1 to 10, I give it a 14. Because what they, what they methodically do is, you know how many times in the Bible you'll see a verse? And whatever, whatever, whatever. And then you go to the next verse. Sometimes there's 20, 30, 50, 120 years in between those two verses. A whole lot of living went on in between those two verses. Did you know that? Many times you read a story, Jesus did this, and then he did this, and then you find out, wow, that was like six months later that Jesus actually did the next thing. So there's all this living going on. And even around the Jesus, even around his ministry, even around uh, his birth, even around... Every single thing, there's all this tapestry of history taking place. And, and, and it's swirling around uh, our, our, our concept of what things are. What I love about The Chosen is it shows the disciples 
as being at times a bunch of imbeciles. And, and when you look at the old movies, the disciples are all, everybody looks like they're from a Sears catalog, you know? You know, I mean, everybody looks together. Everybody looks nice. Everybody looks attentive. You know what I mean? And what I like about The Chosen, man, they spend a lot of time showing how much, how weird these guys were and how mean they were to each other and how they were struggling to comprehend what, what is happening. What, what are we supposed to do? Where's the master? The master's been gone all day. Why is he gone all day? Our picture is that when Jesus showed up, oh, Lord, we were just fasting and praying, waiting for you to return. No, they were upset that he was gone all day. He'd say, I'm going to go somewhere, and they expect him back in an hour, and he comes back at 9 o'clock at night when he left at 8 in the morning. And they're all ticked. And we don't picture the humanity that surrounds the story. And that's where the chosen is beautiful in, in depicting how it probably was. When I look at those apostles, that's exactly how it is. Because if God were to take 12 goofy, normal people, abnormal people in this world, I'm not going to say normal, because we're all abnormal, amen? When, when God calls us, he didn't call us because we were normal, amen? He called us that through after a lifetime, we might get to the point to where there might be some normality in us when we go to be with the Lord. So he picks out these 12 guys, these crude fishermen, this tax collector, a few farmers. The, none of them have, have education, a standard of education that thousands of people around there did. He picks these crude, rude, these these weird people, and he calls them to turn the world upside down. And I'm telling you that that is no different than what is God. God is still doing that in the church today. He's taken people that are broken. We're, we're like birds with broken wings. But, but God says, you are going to fly. It's just a matter of time. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. So how do we strain ahead? James 1.4 talks about, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. To be mature and complete. And whenever somebody leaves us to go into eternity, just like when Nancy left us, Roy left us, Bud left us, they left mature, but they left complete. There was a completeness in their life. There, there, was, there was, when you look at their lives, there was, there was so little else that you could picture that they had to accomplish. Remember when my brother Joe died, he was 53. And I remember at first, it's like, how can somebody so young be allowed to die? I mean, you know, it just didn't make sense to me. But I remember that the Lord just gave me this, this, this it was a sense of peace that this is when he was to really go home. And I remember I went to my mom and I said, mom, how do you feel really now? It was like six, seven, eight months after Joe died. How do you feel about it? And she says, it's the strangest thing. I'm really okay. And I remember talking to his wife. I said, Ronnie, what do you think? And she said, God has just given me this unbelievable peace that this was when he was to go. I talked to his son and his daughter. Every member of the family had this sense that at 53 years of age, it was okay to say goodbye. Wow. That freaks me out because we always look at something and we say, he's robbed of this, he's robbed that. The world goes on and no matter, I could be 99 years old and if I die going to eternity, something's going to happen in my family six months later. People are going to say, oh, I wish the Pastor Jim was here to see that. There's always going to be something in the future that they won't see from the human eye, but who knows what's going on in eternity, my friend, amen? Who knows? I have no idea. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of indication, but who knows what's going on really in eternity right now? Who knows? When people go to be with the Lord, do, do they know, are they allowed to know anything? First of all, you are in such a resplendent glory of, of his presence. I don't know about you, but when I have been uh, experienced the Holy Spirit to the point that I'm on the ground and I can't even move. I'm not thinking about things that I'm missing. 
I am so captured by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I got to be honest, when people go to be with the Lord, I have a feeling that's that's probably what it's like. Pick the best time, that pick the moment that you thought you experienced the Holy Spirit, the most that you ever did, and picture if that were to never abate or never go away or never, never, uh, not go away. The Holy Spirit doesn't go away. But just picture the best moment you've ever had with God. And if it were to be 24 hours a day, continual. And in eternity, there is not the time. It's not the clock. There is simply this constant presence, this constant sense of the presence of God. I can't even, it's almost hard to fathom. Because whether you like it or not, we, we, we kind of rate these things, we measure these things by, by a, a dis, a kind of a distance quotient. We, we have a number on it. We have a time frame on it. And God is a God. He's even above time because time, believe it or not, was created for our benefit. Time wasn't created for God. Time was created for us. With God, there is no time. And that's hard to figure out. What are we going to do in heaven? What are you going to do with your smartphone in heaven if there's no time? <laughs> Hallelujah. In Psalms 1, 1 through 3, blessed is the one who does not walk in, the, in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither whatever they do prospers. And I think about whatever they do prospers. And I got to be honest, I'm not sure that's success. Prospering may not really be successful. There's people that serve God and they don't look like they have any success and yet they're 100 million percent prospering in God. There's Christians by the maybe hundreds of thousands in the world, they're sitting in jail cells for no other crime except that they passed a page of scripture off to another Muslim or who knows what they're in there for. Folks, you're not going to see uh, the big rallies that they're holding and all the, all the wonderful works of God that are happening in their meetings. No, because they're sitting in a jail cell for, for nothing else except that they have confessed Jesus Christ and they will not bow away from the Lord. So does that look like prosperity? If you listen to the big box preachers, is that prosperity when people just suffer in quietness and humility for Christ? No, but in heaven, my friends, my, do you see what I'm saying? They're prospering in the kingdom of God. We still have, thank God, we still have a nation where there's the level of freedom that we're able to still get together, worship, do, do the outreaches. And I got to be honest with you, I... Looks like everything's falling apart, but I, I honestly don't agree with that. I think, yeah, some things are falling apart, but God, God has, he's not done. He's not done with us. And, and America does not deserve anything from the Lord. Amen? But, but God does not lead millions of Christians to, to cry out for revival and cry out for repentance for a nation that is unable to experience Another wave of the grace of God. The Lord does not put a carrot in, it, you know, like the our gang comedies. The, the curtain opens and there's a carrot in front of the mule and, and, it go, and it never gets to the carrot. No, God never puts a, 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 a carrot in front of us that we can't bite into. So when God places it on our heart for freedom and places it on our heart for revival and places it on our heart to, for, for the exercise of those things... It's not a phony thing. It's not something that is unattainable. It is something by faith that I believe it is. So our nation, uh, yeah, some things are going to be bad and some things are going to get worse, but, but I really believe that I believe we're going to see some good things in the next few years. There's going to be some bad things, but I believe there's going to be some good things. And when they start happening, I'll tell you, hallelujah, I'm watching, I'm listening. I got my ear in the track, and I'm not, I'm not a doomsdayer, Amen. I'm, I'm, I believe that God is preparing some good things for us. So the finish line, amen, amen. Yeah, praise God. Because we're not, we're not allowed when we watch the news, we're not allowed to ever know anything good going on. 
I mean, take the top 20 headlines, even the ones that are positive, they're actually really, usually really bad things, okay? They, but they present it in a way, okay? Amen? It, it's it's kind of like uh, when, uh, when, you know, a commercial on TV for something that's really unspeakably bad, but they wrap it up and, you know, they have, you know, all kinds of pretty colors and pictures, you know, it's... It's like a product that you really don't want to buy, but boy, the box sure looks good. <laughs> and in a way, that's the way the news is. So, but we're coming to the finish line to this year. Now, I know in one way it's nothing more than, than a number on a calendar. Isn't that true? But in a way it's not. Because we are coming out of one year and we're going into another. And whether we like it or not, we're going to be leaving a season and we're going to be entering into another. So my prayer is that in year 221, we finish strong. We finish the year, amen, with our hands in the air, admitting that we've run the race this year. And if God gives us strength to run another year, we run. Because as our Trudy the other night, she had no idea when she stood here with, and I, Praise God. You know, I know you guys don't like me taking pictures <laughs> sometimes, but during the candle ceremony, I got pictures all around, and I've got a good shot of her holding her candle. That's the last picture of her that will probably be taken on this planet. I had no idea when I took that picture the other night that that, that might be the last time that somebody takes a picture of her. Amen? Okay. <laughs> now, how many remember when I used to be able to, to stand, to just right from here, stand up here and just get up there? How many remember that? I don't do that anymore, okay? Amen. Let's stand and open our songbooks to number 12, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have done that. I... That, what, what do they say? Watch out for that first step. Amen. Hallelujah. They ain't kidding, man. Hallelujah. The second one ain't so bad, but the first one. Going to need therapy this week. <laughs> okay. Praise the Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. Number 12. Has God been faithful this year? Yes. Have we been faithful? Well, to some degree, yeah. Some degree, I think we've been faithful, but there's always somewhere else in my heart that needs to be yielded to the Lord. Isn't that true? There's always something else. I'm, I'm just amazed that this far, how far I still have to go. And you know why that's true? Because no one gets to the end of who the Lord is. When a person thinks that... Yeah, I know, yeah, I know exactly the way God completely is. When people talk, that's pride, my friends. That's not, that's not spiritual uh, wisdom. The deeper you get into the Lord, the deeper he gets. The farther you get into the Lord, the farther that you will have a sense that you could go. Because, because there is no limit to his love, to his grace, to his mercy, to his righteousness. There is no limit. It is unlimited. And I have not experienced nor have I obediently lived to the full measure of those virtues. <laughs> and, and if you have already, then you should be floating up into heaven. You'd be, you'd be getting hit by the propellers up there, amen, as you're floating up there. You know what I mean? But you notice how gravity still has a little bit of hold on us, amen? Amen? Praise God. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, Thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness. 
Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I hath needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto thee. I love this verse. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest. Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto thee. Verse 3. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand besides. Sing a church. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto thee. One more time. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I hath needed, thy hands hath provided. One, two, three. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto thee. Amen. Praise God. Thanks, John. Hallelujah. Amen. Good to have somebody come in in the seventh inning. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we give you the praise, we give you the glory for this day. And Lord, my prayers that every single one in this sanctuary will just make that commitment in their heart. God, I want to finish this season strong. For God, we have a new season coming. I have no idea what's going to happen, happen next year. There's going to be the normal nonsense. But God, there is also going to be a fresh revelation of your glory and your mercy, and your grace in our lives. And we will see and experience things, Lord, that we have never experienced before. We will have prayers answered that perhaps we've prayed for generations. So God, we are not finished. <laughs> the church is not finished at all. So Lord, we give you the praise, we give you the glory for this beautiful day that you've given us. 
In Jesus' precious name, we commit our hearts to you afresh. Amen and amen.